Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocates, where we attempt to balance the scales and weigh in on the side of justice and truth. I'll be opening the session by advocating on issues concerning the devil and the deep blue sea. Uche is preoccupied with balancing the weighty matters to do with mandatory vaccines and civil liberties. Libras calibrates the issues of Nigerians on truth that have been thrown up especially at this unprecedented time. Chuka is in the epitome of no holds bars as he addresses the matter of a warped mindset. Ekene, on the other hand, throws up the issues of homework and smart work onto the scales. Ultimately, it's clear which side she throws a weight behind. That's how we do business here on The Advocates. We bring up the issues and it's left for you to deliberate on them. All we ask is that you come with an open mind as the session kicks off in earnest after the break. No matter how much of a dilemma we're faced with, when all is said and done, a choice still needs to be made. I'm asking you, between the deep blue sea and the devil, which would you choose? When you're faced with two equally unpleasant tasks, choosing either to obey the other for a gradual easing of the lockdown, or to stay home where you are relatively safe, but suffer the pangs of hunger and its accompanying displeasure. So, when the president announced the gradual easing of the lockdown order from the 4th of May, many assumed it was a tactic to get Nigerians to quit complaining. A reverse psychology, some may say, that was meant to say stay home or battle with your immune system. Even I would have thought that an average Nigerian loves his life enough to want to keep it. Alas, 4th of May came and Nigerians came out in their numbers. The social distance order flagrantly disregarded not by choice, I would say, but for the same hunger which pushed them out in the first place. It means to me that the struggle for a means of survival far outweighs the willingness to leave for which I cannot judge you. A question, however, locks in the hearts of many. Is easing the lockdown really the best solution at this point, given the significant rise in the cases of infections and deaths? While I totally understand the economic hazards of halting activities for a whooping six weeks or more, I assert that there is not much that can really be recouped in these times, especially if same might just be reused to tackle the cases of COVID-19, which would definitely skyrocket from the resulting easing of the lockdown. Let's help put this in perspective. The incubation period for coronavirus is approximately 10 to 14 days. Anyone who happens to be infected on the first day of the easing of the lockdown will begin to show symptoms from the 14th to 18th May. Then you could imagine the number of people this same person might have come in contact with and would in turn have to wait another 14 days to discover the virus in their system. At this moment, I sadly cannot affirm that the government has the lives of its citizens in best interest. But then again, it's your life. I advocate that you choose wisely. Uh, yeah, fantastic, good one, um, straight to the point. But for me, um, you talked about uh, incubation period of 10 to 14 days. Um, hunger does not have incubation period. Hunger is now, now, now. And um, for some of them, they believe, okay, I would rather you know, tackle a problem that I feel now than the one that you know, we won't allow me to live for. 10 days, 14 days, especially, so tomorrow. 
especially given the fact that you know government also had consistently you know given us numbers of those people that they have cured from this and then against also the so many issues of uh, you know some people having to resort to herbal traditional medicine and all of those so the information in that regard is really really lacking especially in a third world country like ours, ours where there are no cushion you know there are no welfare welfare mm -hmm. to cushion the effect of the hardship and and so somebody will sit back and say well wrong as they may be they'll look at it from okay i'll have 14 days to live if i go out but if i sit in i might die today i mean i don't even blame the average man on the street so i wouldn't even say that the problem is with them mm -hmm. i blame the government squarely yes. I, I think when you use the term devil and deep blue sea it needn't have been so if you look at at every point you know you don't have the welfare system or you do even the medical system to cope if a virus got into your country and yet you didn't take acute decision to shut down your airport and keep out yeah, the external exactly. Okay, that won't happen. Then you know that you can't afford a community spread. You didn't take the lockdown seriously enough to implement a proper palliative, you know, Measures. you say buffer. Mm -hmm. You didn't. Now, okay, fine. That has even gone. Now you let people out. And yet the preventative measures you've put are so half-baked. How can you say 60%? You haven't even worked it out for the average man. <laughs> and then you let, you, the people in the banks, I even blame them as well. You know that if people are let out, they're going to come in droves. And yet you tell people, oh, between 10 and this time, you can cash your check. You're asking for trouble. So why don't we take those preventative measures? Where the problem, it's not the devil and the DBC, there are choices to be made, but each time we fail to make those choices because we're looking at, we have a narrow focus. The, the thing I, 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 in a way, I want to say I like about COVID-19 is that it's going to force you to face the music. If you make those kind of half-baked decisions and you're looking at the smaller issues, maybe your own self, maybe penny-wise and pound-foolish, you will live to rue the day when, when the chicken will come home to roost because if people start dropping dead, God forbid, people will point hands at you and blood will be on your hands. Yeah, we should but, wake up and make it, those decisions today. Can it, can it, the problem is you make it look as if the government care. They no, don't. We, have to, we have to we, behave like that so we can hold them accountable. Which, which we can't is, completely which is why, which is why I, I said, you know, at this point, we can't really say that the government has our best interests at heart. Oh, yeah. we, we just like you explained, with the way they handled this from the initial stage, we knew quite all right, but meanwhile, somebody was boasting that we could tackle COVID-19 from the onset. And then it came. This is, where, this is the sad reality of where we're faced. And then the average Nigerian, note that you know, the poverty rate in Nigeria is it's well over for the 5% at this stage. So now the average Nigerian, not knowing what to do, okay, you're telling you, come out and your life is you know, at risk. Mm. And if you well, stay, like in, says, if you stay in, the in, the, in the house, so your, mm. house your, your life is also at risk. Yeah. So you have to choose in between. between. You, you and just know, like you said, most of them would choose you know, to go out, fend for themselves, and you know, the survival that, instinct. Look at, look at, just before the, 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 the program, I discussed the case of uh, Gombe with you. Mm -hmm. Imagine people in isolation centers, no drugs for them and no food. So, so where, and, do, and, and where so do we lay the where, blame Exactly. So I don't know, did I hear so, Uche or, or Chuka trying to come in? <laughs> well, I can come okay. in on this. Yeah. I can come in. Yes, um, yes, you can. Okay, so first of all, let's look at how many people are in poverty in Nigeria. We have 83 million Nigerians in poverty can't send 83 million people into their homes, nothing to eat, no light, no nothing. And you think you're going to have an effective lockdown. That's not going to happen. Secondly, let's look at whether lockdowns are actually effective. Now, I was yesterday, I came across some news from um, the, the, basically the New York governor, Cuomo, was giving a, a press briefing. And what was staggering was that 66% of the people um, that were actually, you know, he actually said that they literally stayed indoors. These people stayed indoors, yet 66% of them were tested, tested positive for COVID. Now, there's so many reasons one has to wonder um, why, whether the lockdown is effective, whether it's not, but I can certainly say it cannot be effective in a country that is suffering with this level of poverty. It just can't be. So I don't even really see it as a, between the devil and the deep blue, whatever, because really Nigerians survive day to day. So you can't ask anybody to suddenly stop, go home, sit down and do nothing. 
So I think the right thing to do was really to ease the lockdown. Let Nigerians fend for themselves because the government isn't going to do no, anything. Question, I think lockdown is issue. effective, Sha. It let is. Me, let it me is, say that for is, the record. It is effective. Lockdown is clearly it is, it is. I said, I said, let's look at it. I'm not saying it's not. I just said, Uche, let's look at it. I'm just giving you some Uche, stats. For me, it is, if, if properly, let's, let's, let's uh, put things in perspective. If properly managed, the lockdown is very, yeah, very effective. Is. Take, for example, the case of uh, hard cost to quarry with... Um, you know, some government officials in Anambra. Anambra had no case of coronavirus. And then, um, for me, I expected them once... As, you, as long as far as we know. Yes. <laughs> once you lock down the states, don't allow anybody coming. Anybody coming should be quarantined for at least Sorry, 14 I think, is, days. Is Chuka trying to come in? Um, the, the, you see, the thing is, um, I disagree with liberals. It's not effective. It will never be effective. It will Thank not you. be effective you have allowed because me finish Nigeria before you is not with ready. Me. We're, we're 60 years not ready. And that's, that's, that's almost criminal. But Libra is not month. effective no. in Nigeria. No, no, the lockdown no. allows you... Uche, the lockdown um, allows you to get stuff ready so that when you ease it, you are able to have the hospital beds, the equipment, uh, people are obeying the social distancing, working from home in spite of the ease of the lockdown. Nothing I've just said can happen in Nigeria. No, 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 saying no, what you were saying. He says it's typically no, effective. Uh, 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 Chuka, Chuka missed my point. So it is ineffective because no. it is not, it, all it will do is that unless you keep us in perpetual lockdown for 20 years, the moment you release it, we are back to square one. That's not effectiveness. No, no, no. Uh, Chuka, you... And, and also, Chuka, Chuka, sorry. It's, it's you, going to fail. Chuka, sorry, you missed my point. My point is, mm. if properly implemented, if properly implemented... Said. Yes, I know. It cannot be properly implemented. Not by your government. The, the, then, 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 then you qualify it. You should qualify it. Well, we each have a part to play in ensuring we conquer this global threat that confronts us all. After the break... Oche speaks up for civil liberties in the face of a so-called emergency measures that seem to threaten more than the secure. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable there was a time in this country when yes. things actually worked. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. If you give with one hand and then take away much more with another, it is a sleight of hand and a magician's trick. My topic today is mandatory vaccines versus our civil liberties. As COVID-19 spread across the globe, citizens were told time and again that there is no known cure and that the only way we can all go back to normal life is if we go the route of mandatory vaccinations against the disease. Though several studies have shown the effectiveness of a combination of drugs and even local herbal blends, such as the one being produced for consumption in Madagascar. Just over a week ago, the Nigerian people learned that the House of Representatives has resumed consideration of a bill to repeal the Quarantine Act and enact the Control of Infectious Diseases Bill. The bill has already gone through the first and second reading with no public hearing. The speed and nature at which the bill is being pushed through has raised suspicion. The issue of vaccination as contained in part three and four of the bill is causing great concern on social media for the following reasons. Clause 31 makes it mandatory for anyone on an international voyage to be vaccinated. And clause 48 reads that in an outbreak or suspected outbreak, 
the Director General may, be, may, by order, direct any person or class of persons not protected or vaccinated against the disease to undergo vaccination or other prophylaxis which within such a period as specified. The members of the House who raised the alarm pointed out that the contents of the bill fitted perfectly into some conspiracy theories that are being peddled on social media locally and internationally on the intention of some suspicious global power interests to create vaccines, forcefully make people accept these vaccines and go further to implement the means of identification by way of chips, implants, or any other means they deem fit to identify those that have taken the vaccines. As a strong proponent of freedom of choice, I am not comfortable with mandatory vaccination. I believe this goes against our individual civil liberties. It should be an individual choice whether to take a vaccine or not. There is some evidence that vaccines have caused health complications and even death. The Indian government filed a case against the Gates Foundation due to the complications and death that occurred in 2009, soon after the administration of HPV vaccine on 120 girls without proper consent. On this basis alone, vaccines should never be forced. Full consent must be sought prior to. I, for one, haven't found the flu vaccine to be effective. I have had it twice, but still got the flu, and it still kills roughly between 291,000 and 646,000 people globally every year. There is also still an ongoing debate whether the MMR triple vaccine is responsible for autism. With all these to consider, I propose no vaccine should be mandatory. The public should be given as much information as possible regarding the vaccines to aid comprehensive decision making. Also, adequate compensation must be put in place in case the vaccine is found to cause any adverse effects or even death. Okay. I'm jumping in mm. there uh, quickly because um, I just want to offload my own bit and then I'll see what <laughs> other people have to say. I mean, generally, I agree with you that, um, you know, um, there's something very suspicious about the speed with which this bill was you say accelerated and it, it's just so ironic that when we have things that need doing swiftly we don't get that kind of reaction and then when it comes to something like this see how quickly it was escalated showing that we have the capacity so there's something dubious about the motive behind it but thankfully i think there's enough of an uproar that things have you know it's had to be put on ice at least for now but the issues i wanted to raise very quickly were i think vaccines generally um are known to work better when they're taken in a collective. So that doesn't mean I'm saying you should force someone to take a vaccine, but I think it's dangerous for people to feel they have the option to opt out because if, for example, uh, let's say polio or any of these vaccines, people started saying, well, I, I feel like I don't feel like. You can imagine polio can become a very dangerous thing once again. So the reason we're saying things like polio are behind us is because there was a collective a consensus that everybody be vaccinated. So even with the uh, autism, and I have experience in that at least, even when I have my suspicions, I wouldn't necessarily be an advocate to say opt out. So what I tended to do with my children because of my experience was I broke it down. I still made sure they had the measles, mumps and rubella, but I didn't give it collectively because I was suspicious that maybe the collective had an impact on their immune system. But I wouldn't necessarily, I would never advocate that someone opt out of vaccines because I think that's a dangerous and a slippery slope. And then just to end it, I feel the whole issue of conspiracy theories, I tend to, again, I'm not interested in conspiracy theories because that's a whole area of shadows. And once you go down there, you're open to manipulation. So let those people who want to dabble in that dabble in it. Let's deal with the hard facts in front of us. The, thing, the known facts tell us that even as it stands, that bill is a dubious bill. Yeah, um, that's, I think that's where... Um, uh, Uche, Uche is coming is from, coming from um, because um, when, when it is shrouded in um, so much uh, secrecy and you're so much in a hurry, you know, to push it down the throat of people that you want to vaccinate, and then there's need to raise sus suspicion. And then also, if um, allowed to see the light of the day, you're, you're talking about opting out. Yeah, why well, I also agree <coughs> that um, if there is enough information, if, if you give people enough information, then they will make up their mind to say, okay, no, I won't opt out. But when there is no information at all, and then there is no option to opt out, what if it, it, it uh, causes debt? You walk, you know, boldly into your own debt. Uh, so if you look at the, the, the bill from section 12 all the way down, 
you, it's, um, it's, 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 it's um, a totalitarian bill, haven't been copied from, from Singapore, from <laughs> Singapore <laughs> that practice um, a, a, a one, party, one party government in 1977, if you remember Lin Kuan Yew, and then, you know, so there were no opposition and the people didn't have a say in what happened. Even that bill, that law had been amended in Singapore. And, but here we are, going back to copy what they have even updated. Mm. A situation where you even, you know, take away the right of people to challenge the decisions mm. so made. And if the decisions go wrong, there are no room for compensation mm. and you cannot, challenge. You, you can't challenge them, you can't sue them. If, if, even if a member of the disease control team makes a wrong decision, you know, he cannot be sued for it. And the decision of the minister, in as far as that bill is concerned, is final. You know, so all of this, if a whistleblower gives information and that the uh, disease control feels it's um, adversely at affect, uh, 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 that affects, you know, the organization adversely, that whistleblower, be a journalist, can also, you know, be taken and arrested without warrant. Yeah. So when you put all of this together, you ask yourself, uh, is if this a, a bill? that is ready to actually vaccinate people and cure them from a disease or a bill that is actually pushing the people down the line, you know, of the disease. And, and, and so when you look at all of this, then you can say that let people have a choice, even if the bill must see the light of the day. I, I, think, I think that, um, you know, you've, you've actually highlighted all of the problems with this bill. And the problem with our lawmakers is that they approbate on one hand and at the same time reprobate. Yeah. Now, the Constitution is there as our guiding light. Yes, exactly. Guiding light. This is the grand norm of the country. And so any law you are to make should be in, in tandem consonance. Mm. with the Constitution. So now the Constitution on the one hand says there is freedom of choice. You lawmakers who are supposed to actually make our laws gather together, seek to deliberate a law that deliberately takes, takes the right choice. of citizens. Mm. It's absurd. The, the problem I see here is the one of a new world order where everything is questioned by everybody, even when the experts have spoken. Everybody is talking about what if the vaccination does this to me, blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, if we don't vaccinate everybody, how are we going to be sure we're going to eradicate something? That's number one. Okay. Number two, have you read if you're asking... Been, no, no, he's making a general asking, point. Mm. Huh? No, go if on. You're asking what it, if, if you're asking what is in the va vaccination, have you ever asked a structural engineer what's inside the columns and beams in your house before you moved in and be sure that the house will not collapse on you when you're sleeping? You Good don't points. because you have trust. Yeah. It's only through trust that so we can trust, do things. It's the trust so issue if, that's dubious. So if the process... Yeah. If the process of Chuka, the vaccination... Chuka, let me your argument when you are done. Yeah. Uh, go, go on, Chuka. Go on. If it, is, if it is shrouded in secrecy, then that's one problem. But I think we're beginning to become too outspoken. I think this politically correct world is disintegrating the world. And that's why we, we pick on certain things and just refuse to accept anymore. I keep wanting to understand this thing. If people are vaccinated, what is their problem with those that are not vaccinated? It, it, brings, you know, down, it brings down the immunity in a, in a sort of, you know, if you're looking for a, a uh, what do you call it, herd immunity type of, it, it's an artificial form of mm. herd immunity. So the more people opt out of the vaccine, the more ineffective it is. It means that those people okay. are open to developing that disease and essentially everybody is vulnerable. So it's all or nothing. All right, no problem. Yeah. But if, if they give the right, they're not giving information. The reason why one has to look at the conspiracy theories and all those things is because of the nature and the speed at which this bill was passed. Okay. Well, beyond conspiracy theories, I think we all agree that preserving civil liberties speaks to fundamental human rights. After the break, Libros is on the trail of a similarly fundamental issue that is at the foundation of our social contracts. Truth is not the absence of falsehood, but the ability to uphold a fact or belief that is accepted as true irrespective of whose us is good. And until truth stand tall in our country, justice and a sane society will continually elude us, Nigeria and the value of truth. What is our truth? Ask these simple questions because with the COVID-19 pandemic, the past few weeks have been further exposed our deceit, lies, propaganda, and barefaced falsehood as a government and people in Nigeria. Is it with the death of the chief of staff to the president, or the lies and uncertainty about the death in Kano to the crowd at, the, at most of the barriers. But why people in Lagos were complaining about the crowd at the barrier of Sheikh Gomi, Modugoni, 
a reverend cleric in Meduguri last week, we kept silent in the face of the mammoth crowd and traffic in Lagos on the 4th of May, despite the state directives to the contrary. We refused to discuss refederating the country, but our state governors, who had hit to criticize previous government for deporting citizens from their state, now deport Almajiris with ease. Kano State Governor chooses to relax lockdown in the midst of increasing numbers of coronavirus patients, death and chaos. Yet, he's neither corrected by his advisors nor criticized by Northern leaders because he's from the same place with them. An Antony General charges Fuke Akindele for violating social distance regulations, but gather a crowd of journalists, much more than that of the accused, to explain his legal triumph. We are told to look the other way because as ministers in the Temple of Justice, we should really see evil, hear evil, but must not speak evil. What is our truth? A National Assembly is confronted with a pandemic and lack of adequate legislation to deal with the situation. And rather than confront the executive to find a homegrown approach and methodology to combat the same, they must copy and paste a 1977 Singaporean law to compulsory vaccinate the people and compel them to comply, failure which they can be punished. Yet the same assembly is not channeling the same energy to create legislation that would compel actions towards finding a local vaccine stroke treatment despite the abundance of natural resources in Nigeria. A private institution spends time and money to research and create a cure for a pandemic, yet our government looked the other way because it didn't come from a foreign country. Maybe it's because of the donations coming in. An opposition party, once out of government, begins to criticize everything they once held tenaciously to as truth, while the ruling party begins to do exactly what they once condemn and criticize. Yet the willers and hailers in us will queue behind them, and we want truth. EFCC recovers and confiscates assets of so many former government officials, yet government claims to be looking for private properties to convert to isolation centers. I laugh. A president is unavailable to answer burning questions provide leadership and give answers to concise questions and a clear-cut direction in a pandemic situation apart from a pre-recorded broadcast. And we refuse to inform him that is a recipe for failure and disaster because we want to be politically correct. We divert money and palliative men for the poor in a worse situation into private use, forgetting that we might not live to spend such money. And the government is too calm to investigate same. Government issues directive and instructions on managing the crisis. Why does the government flout same sanctions, the rest of us bluntly refuse to co comply, yet we want the abatement of the pandemic. You claim to be a member of civil society organization, but displaying civility in the larger society, whilst bashing government for simply following your step. I ask you, what's your truth? And I'm sure when all of this is over, our pastors and imam will tell their faithful to come for thanksgiving with nairas, pounds, dollars, and euro to celebrate the defeat of the virus despite not doing anything to contribute to the cure. Foolishly, we must all go, as they say, touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm. We all must find our truth someday. We close our borders to become self-sufficient in food production. But in the face of a pandemic, we don't even have enough food to give to the poor. Yet we all maintain a conspiracy of silence. We copy democracy and refuse to either practice it or modify it to suit our peculiarities, yet expect to excel in it. My advocacy today would be, until we find our truth as a country and stand with it irrespective of our tribe, position, religion, or political affiliation, be it in government or out of government, because our leaders are drawn from among us, we will keep dancing in circles and pointing accusing fingers at one another, but ourselves, until we disintegrate as a country, which if care is not taken, might be sooner than expected. This is my truth. When you find yours, add it here, say it loud, stand for it and defend it, even if you stand alone. Let me just say, um, you know, there's a lot of truth in what you say. Um, however, I want to just pull back a bit and say, why is it that we're behaving like this? Because your truth, the truth you express, cut from the top to the bottom. So yeah. it's not like we're just saying it's a manifestation of those at the top. It, it cuts all the way through. So when you were talking, I was thinking, why are we like this? Why are we the way we are? And it's not because we're black or some strange concept. No, People are, it's, concept. Because, it's because we don't have a system that puts in checks and balances. And I would even Fantastic. say, listening to what you're saying, we need to even now double up and say, we should be more harsh against those who um, do all these things in leadership because the body language for me starts at the top. So even if you're in an organization, no matter how small or a private one, even in your home, the people behind you are looking at you to see how you handle, you know, crimes and misdemeanors. If you don't 
do that's what we wanted from our president we thought yeah, exactly. he's coming in exactly. he's going to have a strict Quite face exactly. anybody that tries and then he will ward off corruption even if he achieves just that and gets rid of Boko Haram he has done enough but because he has failed to do that then everybody is running riot doing whatever they like so I would say yes a combination of we need to now look for ways to bring in stricter penalties against the elites against those who are in leadership positions we should go after them you know as though we're going after our own life because they are they have our lives in their hands and then after that we need to now recognize that what really ties people to living by truth is conscience. You have to be able to see what is right in your heart and do it. As long as you have this sense that there is relative truth and that, okay, you can get away with this, but not get it, then you let yourself off the hook and then everybody will do whatever seems right in their own eyes and everything will be falling apart around quickly, you. Exactly. Uh, so I think sorry, quickly. Okay. I am I, I'm, I'm inspired by your position most times. That's why I, I, I talked about this truth. You say you you are in traffic, and then you see everybody shunting, and you refuse to shunt, but you insist that the right thing must be done. And so I look at all of it, and we say, "Oh, government did this," but rather than correct them, we keep quiet, and then we follow suit. We can't build a country like that. Yeah. And then election comes, you say, "Oh, uh, since they are all giving money, let me collect, and then I can't beat them." We, if we stand together, we can, we can beat them. Of course. True. It's true that you say that, um, you know, this truth has to be collective because um, yeah. over time, there's been a lot of talks about truth being subjective. Okay. So it's about a particular individual's truth. It is my truth. Mm. It is his truth. Mm. So I won't be surprised if people come out to say, oh, that's libraries. Even in his advocacy, he said that. You come out and truth. say your own truth. But COVID-19 so, will let us live by our own truth. Everybody has to have a collective has to responsibility or we'll die. Especially the leaders. Yeah. You know, um, his advocacy talks about, you know, the um, state government issuing directives about the easing of the lockdown, whereas we came out to it. But how how do you then get to separate the truth? Because the truth in, in that regard was the fact that no proper measure was put down, put in place. And then so the citizens came out in their numbers and disregarded yes. the other. So that is their truth. This thing, the, the, the last um, topic, again, flows into this. Um, we're talking about truth. Um, and it varies, yes, depending on how rich or how poor you are or how much power you have. Those in power have absolute power now. And so if they do anything, there's very little it looks like we can do about it. it. When um, that fellow, Adeshino, I think is his name, the, the, the press chap to the president, yes, when he says that the president's absence is a question of style and that the president does not, you know, basically saying that the president does not see any point in being around in you know being available yeah, and all that. to the people um, you, you you find that when somebody can say that that is the aid to a president then there's something wrong with both the aid and the president yeah. and then therefore the way the country is run but and that that's truth? why we're in trouble we're in trouble we because we can't control the narrative yeah, I mean, um, I agree with Chuka in the sense that they have a lot of power right now and it's going to be no, very very difficult to get rid of them um, especially as they have also hijacked our electoral system. So we can't even, you know, be sure that the person we vote for will be the person that will actually win an election. So until we can either change our voting system to make it more transparent so that we can be sure that the people of Nigeria, whoever they vote in, comes in, that, you know, that's, things aren't going to change. Secondly, we also need to learn how to hold our leaders accountable. Yeah. Um, I don't think we do that. We don't do that enough. No, and no we don't. That we're we so don't. divided. Yeah. We're divided on a million and one lines yeah. that even when you say, oh, this one did this, somebody's quick to say, eh, but your own guy did Yes, this. they're As looking at the tribal know, institutions. Yeah. Make a right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, we have a lot to work on if yeah. we're to get to, you know, a place where we will now have a collective truth. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, like I said, if time will permit us, we all know that one characteristic of truth is that it ought to be shared. So here's where you share your truth with us about our advocacy. The conversation goes on as concern whether African can conquer COVID-19 with a copy and paste. Mama Pat Dutor says, brilliant conversation. Whereas Osas Ewere says, Africa is a paradise, but we haven't gotten the right leadership to make it what it is. I hope we'll get there one day. God bless Africa. Thank you. 
On African Religion and Foreign Gods, Part 1, Cherry says the ladies need to listen to the gentlemen as they are speaking wisdom on this topic. At least a fellow woman said it, not me. Point taken, Sherry. Do keep your comments coming in on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, and on Twitter and Instagram, at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. After the break, Chuka addresses the state of the nation with some straight talk, and trust Chuka, shoot straight from the hip. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Well, telling ourselves the truth or self-therapy, either way, the truth must out. So today I'm discussing altering our warped mindset. Another 300 odd million dollars of Abacha looted funds returned to Nigeria. I wonder when this particular tap will run dry. This is not including loot kept away by Abacha's accomplices. Up to now, the question of good luck Jonathan's culpability in the massive looting undertaken by his trusted associate and former petroleum minister, Jay Zane Madweke, is unanswered. And the list is as long as the number of political office holders that there have been. Yet, Nigerians continue to ask for a return of a past rogue when an incumbent is a disappointment. Memory loss or rank stupidity or some other form of sickness or plain paid agents of destruction. Your guess is as good as mine. As a people, we must understand that there are alternatives to mediocrity and crime. We must not succumb to Stockholm Syndrome. When things are not right or immoral, we must reject them. And let's not live by generalities. Take the case of a large number of condemnations of the work of the late Abakari, who was chief of staff to Buhari. Speaking ill of the dead is not the same as being truthful about anyone dead or alive. We must be truthful regardless. We need to improve and restructure our collective mindset. We need to develop new systems of government that erase the various imperial excellencies that parried as president, governors, and others. We need real democratized spread of resources such that education and health shoot to the top of our priorities. When this happens, people will develop a healthier and less immoral attitude and approach to nation building with a sense of responsibility and humility. We have had time to think during the lockdown. We must approach things differently post-COVID. If we do not achieve this reorientation, we are doomed to failure, poverty, and disintegration. Yeah, um, which brings me back to my advocacy on um, truth. I like the word we. Yes. Um, for me, uh, it is obvious. Um, it is uh, very visible to even the blind that, um, you know, we cannot, um, we shouldn't expect anything from our government. And the only way we can change our government is not for us to wait for the government to change. It is for us to believe that we indeed can change. Look at um, 2015. A lot of people wanted Buhari. Oh, yes, Buhari will come and change things. We all came out in the rain, in the sun to vote. Uh, but why is it that in 2019, when rather than all come out again and say, look, the way we did it in 2015, a lot of people became complacent. That, oh, what we did in 2015, look at the results. So what's the hope? So for me, we need, we have we've been speaking consistently to the leaders that have consistently failed. And the leaders, like I always say, are drawn from amongst us. There's need for us also to speak to ourselves, speak true to ourselves, and agree that 
we are all part of this log jam. We are all part of this problem. And until we decided that, look, I am part of this pool and I want to be different. I know people that pray for me or I pray that they give you appointment. Why they are praying for appointment for me? It's not because they want to change, but because they believe when it gets there, you're, you're their pipeline. Yes. And, and then why some truly, genuinely want people who will get there and make a change. And, and so let's all look at the man in the mirror and say, look, I want to be that change. And if you look at yourself and agree that there is a truth and that we will change ourselves, we can collectively change um, the country. Okay, let me, let me come Quickly, in at sorry, that. Uh. Sorry, just two seconds. All of the loot, Abacha loot, we're talking about now, people helped Abacha to, to loot. loot. It, yeah, he didn't do it by Nobody's himself. talking about those people. Yeah, yeah. Because they are not there. Yeah, yeah. They are alive with Okay, us. okay. Um, like um, um, Libra said, I agree. I, I think the word we is a very positive word. Positive I think word. so that we can all take responsibility collectively. We need that collective responsibility. However, the two issues I want to raise. One is education. People don't wake up and start speaking in a responsible way unless they have a mind that is trained to critically, um, do you say, dissect the issues. Otherwise, all you get are angry people. And sometimes they, they don't understand you know, how they've been duped. I, I hope I'm not sounding patronizing. But I feel that there's a way you educate people, even your own children, that you give them that feeling that they are part of, their voice matters, their opinion matters, and they can opt in or opt out, like we spoke about the vaccine. Mm -hmm. You give them that sense of um, responsibility as well as entitlement. So I think those two need to go hand in hand. Um, the only bit I would just say slightly is that I'm not very comfortable, even though I, I, I'm, I, I somehow I understand where people are coming from when they speak about a dead man. I'm not comfortable with that whole practice, simply because when he was alive, speak about him. When he's dead, he can't answer for himself. I felt a little pang of, there was something wrong with the fact that his daughter had to say, let my father go. You know, he's dead. He's dead. Leave him. <laughs> no. When he was alive, do it. No, okay. Like now, Buhari is alive. <laughs> say your piece. When okay. he goes... I mean, I know people write books. I know they're years afterwards. Yes. I'm coming. Let me land it. They're years afterwards when you can be doing that. But not when they have family members. I just feel there's something, you're, you're, there's something wrong when you in, 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 you're pushing for change and your tactics are just as harsh and inhumane somehow. I don't feel comfortable with it. I have to leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, but you find out that whatever you leave today, remember that people will discuss it. It becomes history. And what is history? History is a way of a life of a people living or dead, especially those that are dead. And, and so your actions and inactions forms part of the history that will be discussed. He was alive. The biography, All these people were not so vocal when the, he was alive. He they dies. Were, they were a very, a lot of really? people were vocal we're against. We're hearing more. No, now a lot dead. of people were vocal against Abakari. Oh. The biography, the history of this when world is the biography alive. of death. No, no, it's only when he died that he was started throwing stones at him. Let me, if you let me, let me, let me do a little analogy. We agree 500 that, million we agree that MTN, stones were thrown MTN at him. scandal. But it wasn't as The way they're throwing stones now. When he's yeah. Yeah. It was even modern. It was no, even modern. No, not, not, not to my take, knowledge. Take That's Reno exactly. Omokri, for example, who criticized Buhari vociferously. The moment Abakari died, he eulogized him and said, look, uh, he That's was a loyal to his no, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you names. I'm giving you names. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Mm. So a lot of people threw We're stones not saying you should lie about when he was alive. He's called him de facto president. Um, and that every problem that Nigerians were going through OB is because you have a Buhari who is not active to his responsibility, and Abakari, even when um, Vice President had issues, except you were not following the news. Maybe I missed So it. when he died, a lot of people more. were scared to talk about ill of the dead, like we always say here, don't speak ill of the dead. So people who Maybe were, following him, different were criticizing him, you know, started talking about well, him. But you know that but there was a lot of sarcasm going on around that time concerning his people death. People so will wasn't... write your history. If you're talking about the circumstances surrounding his death, yes, all of those people talked about all of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. But his actions and inactions, you know, now trying to paint him as if, you know, he was I one did, great man. I didn't man. see that, sure. A lot of people didn't. But for, that. Me, did Uche, oh, for me, I, I when I, you know, when I um, saw all of those um, attempting to eulogize him and, you know, talking about the greatness he did, I interpreted it as sarcasm because there was nothing <laughs> true, to be honest, there was nothing he did to be, you know, to be praised about. So when all those people came out, oh, he did this, he was a great, I just saw sarcasm written all over the post. He was a friend of Christians. And, yeah, um, it was all sarcasm to me, so. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the, the daughter's write-up for me. Well, I don't know. I, I've actually revised how I feel about Abakiari and, you know, I really feel like, you know, we didn't really know the man. 
And I feel also that maybe the opposition played a hand in telling us how to think regarding this man. So, you know, I, we started hearing things like, oh, the facto president, this and that. And that just conjures up all manner, you know, all types of feelings. I really still don't know the man. And after reading that eulogy from the daughter, and even from Femi Fanny Kaede, who is a very vocal against the government, and um, several other people, they actually said that, yes, you know, we may yeah, disagree okay. with the politics okay, of, of, of the um, other but... Which are out of time. Is, those, those who eulogized him but positively. Let me, finish, let me finish so that I don't okay. lose my well, trail of thought. So, so well, yeah, my point is that which are, which we are... are Uche, by 10 minutes is up. 10 minutes is up for, for me on this. Oh, well, sorry. Mm. Yeah, you know how we roll here. Yeah. You know how we roll. Anyway. Um, the expression speaking truth to power refers to a necessary tactics of positioning a nation for greatness. It shouldn't be viewed defensively. After the break, a Kene will be aiming to sensitize us to another movement that can be wrongly perceived. Welcome on board. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. What well, I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Occasionally shelving our original biases can be the beginning of a journey into a refreshing discovery of liberty. I'm going to be talking about how homework can be smart work. A friend recently made the following statement. So your boss lets you work from home? Hmm, that's because he's a kind guy. Nah, that's because he's a smart guy, I responded in my head. A survey by Global Workplace Analytics and FlexJob indicates that the remote work has grown 91% over the last 10 years and 159 over the last 12 years. In Nigeria and possibly in other African countries, working from home is seen as a favor granted to the employee, a kind of soft work for those who can't hack the straight up office nine to five, or in some cases, five to nine. COVID-19 seems to have forced the hands of some employees, making this hitherto taboo area of consideration an unavoidable option. Now the lockdown is being eased and most are geared to return back to business, no questions asked. Working from home was the new normal that was never really normal. The reason being that a lot of bosses are still innately distrustful of their employees, of their ability to govern, self-govern, and plan their work. These bosses feel that unless they can see and directly supervise their employees' comings and goings, they would most likely be four one nine. They're not entirely wrong. However, is this the work culture that we want to cultivate and sustain? Is this what a progressive work culture looks like? I very much doubt it. Working from home, though with its challenges in a nation of epileptic fire power supply and not so reliable internet service, has much to recommend it. It gives power back to the employee by making them responsible for planning their work according to deliverables as opposed to a clock-in, clock-out system which scarcely delivers beyond our familiar practice of eye service. It relies on trust a missing ingredient in most of our working relationships as a people. This trust investment will most likely be rewarded by an employee going above and beyond, at least I can speak for myself. We haven't even begun to mention other benefits like less time spent in traffic and less congestion on our roads and pollution of our environment, not forgetting more flexibility to negotiate work-life balance. I know as far as benefit versus harm goes, this could go either way. Overall, one would hope that if nothing else, this period of intermission has taught us that homework can indeed be smart work. I hope you'll agree. Yeah, to some extent I agree, and then to some extent... I want to hear the extent, the, I want to, hear the extent to which you don't. The, depending on the nature of the job, mm. uh, there are some work you can't do from home. Mm -hmm. uh, why there are so many jobs these days that you can work from home, like 
my office is still uh, under lock and key. Um, my staffs work from home. I just email you what I need you to do. And, and uh, are they delivering? Yes, yes. I don't. Um, for me, is there are time limit. You can give them. Um, you can. You can give them um, what do you call it. Um, uh, a time frame. Okay. So I need this document back in an hour or two. If that person were in, a, in, were in the office, it's the same thing. Give, let me have it in an hour or two. And so with working from home, actually, you can actually work. A lot of organizations work from home. You really? Know, so Nigeria? You, yeah. Yes. You okay. really don't know. That's not the pressure now. Yeah, but you pre, see the... Pre-COVID, I do not know about that. Yes. Yeah, but, right but, but now... Yeah, having you, to adapt. Uh, yes. And, and then, you know, you see it also, apart from all of this benefit that you listed, it also saves time. Because I actually did a lot of work from home. I'm not the office type. I'm not the one that I can wake up 4 a.m., and then straight to my laptop okay. and walk from that time till... But you're your own boss, that's the thing. Yes, mm. but so because I know the benefits and so I also allow people to practice it and, and, and you know, understand okay. it. And learn progressive it. So, man. Yeah, and, and, and so when you understand all of this and now gradually even the courts are beginning to do virtual sitting mm -hmm. and, you know, so we'll pra begin to practice new things. It's not every time that you want people, everybody to be in one space and then, you know, but some, sometimes also, you we also discover now that you can do online meetings and yeah. um, uh, really it's, it's a culture we should uh, embrace, but yeah. there are some jobs, like I said, there are some jobs that you cannot do from home. I thought Chuka was trying to call yeah. you. Oh, is it with you? Yeah, I want to come in. Mm. Okay. Um, I, I agree. I do like the whole working from home culture. In fact, I've been doing it for years now, so it's really not a big deal. I only ever go into the office if I need to. You know, maybe I need to meet with somebody and it's just a little bit more professional to do it that way. But like um, Labora said, there are some jobs that it just doesn't work well for. Um, I'm looking at the teaching, um, teaching jobs. Um, the other day, they tried to hold um, online classes and it did not work. It just didn't. The children couldn't be organized. The children couldn't be controlled. The teacher couldn't come in. She didn't know how to come in. In the end, she had to end the class and, and that was the end of it. Um, so I think, and also maybe medical doctors as well. There's only so much you can do, you know, online. Actually, I'll, I'll come in um, there because um, I, I know someone close to me who is now doing online consultations. And he says everybody's yeah, very happy. But there will, there yeah, will come, are, are what I'm saying is that online. there will come a point where there might be need for a physical. Um, yeah, yeah, no, examination. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there, there are limits to it. So I'm not saying that, you know, you can do online up to a point. Yeah. But I think um, there still needs to be that leeway to have physical meetings um, and physical consultations. Not everything will work well online, mm. you know. Like, for instance, now they're trying to teach our children online, but now the problem is that the parents have to get involved. Yeah. If the parents aren't involved, it if nothing, it's not going to work. And even when I was involved, it still didn't work. So, you know, I think certain things should go back to the way they were, such as... Sometimes you end up copying all the notes. <laughs> and, 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 Sorry? You know, I said sometimes you ended up copying all the notes. <laughs> for the children. Uh, yeah. So, for me, I think that my proposition is the fact that um, if you have absolutely no reason to go to a fiscal space, you know, to, to transact your business, then by all means you can stay at home and work. And it's important that you highlighted the, the challenges that, you know, exist with working from home. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, I, I watched recently um, this interview with um, some, I think it was on CNN or BBC. He was granted an interview and then a little child walked right yes, into the, yeah. that was yes. the workspace for him. Yeah. Yes. But then the little child, you know, unsuspecting, it just walks into the room. So you have such distractions. And which is the reason why, you know, some buses are, you know, somewhat guarding of, okay, no, that you space. need to do this, you need to do that. But, you know, they're not aware of the distractions that exist. Yeah. There's also the fact of, um, you know, data, um, lights. I, I, for instance, having to work from home, I have to turn on my generator, you know, from because we don't have... Who pays for all of those? For, uh, yeah. I also have a colleague or a friend who, you know, we're discussing about this work from home, and I'm like, okay, so what about the data? And he says, ah, my boss told me that if you were going to come to the office, you would spend transport for coming to the office. <laughs> so use your transport fare on your data. Oh my, your this friend. boss is tight. So I mean, 
these but, are some but, of the but, issues. But, but no, I, I was, I, let me just qualify. I know I did the no, advocacy. Sorry, sorry, Kenny. Okay. You, you know, there, there, are, there are so many work we can do from here. Yes, that I was going if there. If only we improve some of this infrastructure, yeah, like lights yeah, yeah. and the internet, internet services. Yeah, yeah. You know, there are so many jobs. Yes. Done. So I mean, I, this idea of decongesting the terminal roads, bridge yeah. also. And I stress, think the stress factor. I think government also should begin to look so in that. Yeah, I mean, Chuka, I, I was just going to say, because I want to hear your thoughts, but I was just going to say that part of my advocacy was never really uh, meant to say everything should be from home. I was just trying to say, yeah. let's even shift away from that presumption that we have to be in the office. I didn't even mention the counter, which is, I love coming into the office. I love seeing my colleagues. I love having fun with them. And that social bond is also important for me. I think staying away from the office sometimes, you feel slightly out of it. It doesn't quite have the same... You know, Effect. yeah, I think it's necessary and it builds, it builds the whole relationship thing and it helps. Sorry, Chuka. Mm. Well, I had actually decided last year that in 2020, I was going to try a new system where we don't come to the office every day okay. uh, so that I could save transport and therefore some of the salary of the staff for themselves, so not for me mm. um, and all that. And then COVID comes along and it makes, makes it, it happen. Easier and then makes the whole world actually consider what I was considering alone. Is it working so for you? It's, yes, it works. Um, there, there are power issues, um, what are other issues, power. I don't see the date to, because an office ought to make available data. Yes. So it's the power, that's the problem. And sadly, 60 years later, we have no power. Now the chicken has come home to roost, and we cannot work from home because we have no power. How sad. No, sad. but we can actually, you, you see, if, if you have, um, if you look at the, the costs of maintaining an office, yes. and then you have em employees, and then you also maybe add a little to their salaries, it's okay, yes, this is for your fear, and this is for your data, mm. you know, because you have to- And your gen. Yes, your that's gen. what you're saying. And, and, mm. and so we, when you put all of this together, it will still not be a, up to what you are yeah. paying for your office. Yes, that's right. Yeah, because you would have, you can saved have a smaller it. office. Yes, yeah, true. you can. You, you can even saved, work from home. Yeah, you, because you saved. <laughs> well, you, you get a smaller you, office. You yeah. also, you also know, you also need to realize that some of those offices made use of desktops. Right, and so their staff had, you know, their personal desktop, but it was un unmovable. So now having to work from home, I see people complain, oh, I do not have a computer. A laptop. And, you know, I don't have a laptop at home mm. or, you know, something like that. But so do you know that in the, some countries... What should the... You should, invest, you should invest in your In staff. some countries, owning a laptop has, is almost a, a fundamental right. Data is like a fundamental <laughs> right. Yes. yes. And, and also, when you... I, I also have tool an advocate of, work. of the moment you employ somebody Equip in this... Them. You equip them. Mm. For, fortunately, I had a friend in Worry. You know, he sent me document and I was to respond. And I said, okay, let me email this document to you. He said, ah, no, I don't have email. I said, this day and age. <laughs> you, you know, strangely. Mm. So we need to equip people, you yeah. know, whether you're working from home or not. So your work becomes flexible. So if anything happens, you can actually be anywhere. I can assess my documents from anywhere. Anywhere, you know? true. Well... We've come to the end of our roundtable discussion on moral dilemmas, civil liberties, and brave new choices. As we go into the week, ensure you greet it with courage and fearlessness. We're with you all the way. Do keep your comments coming in on Facebook, plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocates NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocates NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next time, when we're privileged to engage with you in the interest of a better society, it's bye for now. Bye-bye. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually worked. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of 
the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.